Hi, I'm Rod Adams. I'm the blogger at Atomic Insights. I've been blogging about uh, atomic energy or writing about atomic energy since about 1991. Uh, started off on bulletin boards and uh, the Prodigy Network back in the day. Uh, started Atomic Insights as a paper uh, newsletter in 1995. And in late 1995, a friend of mine uh, named uh, Sama E. Balboa suggested that I put Atomic Insights on the web. And my first reaction back in November of 95 was, what's a web? So Atomic Insights got translated into HTML and has uh, been on the web uh, ever since. We've been publishing new stuff most of the time. Took a, about a year or two break between 97 and, and 2000. It's about a three-year break, 97 and 2000. And uh, then began publishing more and more as we uh, get more excited about what atomic energy can bring to the world. And who who do you believe are the is the biggest audience for your blog? The audience for Atomic Insights is pretty varied. I've never really uh, done any scientific polling. Um, I know that there are a, a lot of folks in the nuclear industry who read at least on occasion because I've gone through and looked at some of the weblogs and seen where the the uh, are coming from is we average somewhere around 800 to a thousand uh, uh, completely unique visitors a day uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 40,000 page views a month um, and right last last time I checked there was visitors on atomic insights from 125 different countries so it's been on the web a long time we get a pretty good discussion going. Uh, occasionally a post will, will get people excited and uh, discussions will uh, generate uh, over 100 comments. I've had two posts in the last month that went well over 100 comments uh, in uh, pretty uh, detailed comments. So we, I, I excise those posts that are simply uh, you know, name calling or, or back and forth. And usually the posts are pretty thoughtful. That we uh, Sometimes the uh, the comments are longer than the original post that generated. Is this a full-time job for you? Oh heck no, heck I. <laughs> well, when you're when you're when you're mo monitoring comments a lot, I could imagine it takes a lot of time. No, I, there's there is uh, there's no revenue uh, generation model for Atomic Insights. Uh, it is a hobby for me. I'm a I'm a 51 year old grandfather. I've got a full-time job. I I. I have to admit, I do work in the nuclear industry. I'm a an engineer slash analyst at the Babcock and Wilcox company, uh, working as a as a minor part of the team that's building the M Power reactor, uh, smaller uh, version of a light water reactor. We call it an integral pressurized water reactor. But uh, that's my full time job. I'm also retired from the U.S. Navy, uh, so I. I really don't need to make a lot of money from blogging. That's not exactly why I do it. I, I sometimes tell people I'm doing this as a payback. The taxpayers in the United States sent me to college. They sent me to graduate school. Uh, they sent me to sea on submarines. I get to learn an awful lot about nuclear energy and what it can do for people. Uh, I've, I've lived in an environment that was 100% nuclear powered. Uh, we had all the power we needed, all the clean water we needed. We made our own air. Uh, you know, it's it's something that, that people just don't hear about. You know, the, the amazing thing about a submarine is the submarines I went to sea on, built with 1960s vintage technology, uh, could stand to water essentially as long as the crew could, could handle being uh, underwater and, and, you know, until we ran out of food. Uh, my submarine was loaded with fuel in 1981, and it didn't get refueled. Ever it, it ended up being decommissioned in 1995 after operating for 14 years on the same load of fuel, and that fuel only weighed a little bit more than I do. I can't say exactly how much, but it, you know, it, it's it's less than the size of a large uh, NFL football lineman. Let's put it that way. So, uh, in in a nuclear submarine, uh, they don't have the same containment uh, uh, restrictions they oh, have. Yeah. So, so that you could actually Absolutely. make, when you're talking about a pressurized water reactor, they can actually be quite small if you do away with the containment vessel then. No, no, no. That's not true. The containment on board a submarine meets the same requirements as the containment buildings, 
that surround a large uh, commercial pressurized water reactor. The reactors are smaller. The containment is not made out of, uh, well, the containment is, is steel. It's in some parts of it is the same containment that keeps the salt water out, uh, keeps high pressure steam and whatever in if there's a problem in the power plant. But we do have containment. Containment's a very big deal on board a ship. Uh, and we, we do use it. We protect the crew. It's, it's no different. We don't use a concrete building because we have steel. We have a lot of steel. So if, uh, uh, so, sorry, so um, if, uh, maybe if you could just restate it that uh, if a pressurized water uh, reactor was built using steel instead of concrete, does that mean that it would be smaller? Oh, pressurized water reactors can be very small. We had, uh, in the U.S., the U.S. Army used to build pressurized water reactors for such uh, tasks as powering uh, research stations in Antarctica and in Greenland, uh, on top of a mountain in Wyoming, uh, in Alaska. And those pressurized water reactors were uh, not much bigger than a trash can. I've got video of the actual construction of the small pressurized water reactor that, that supplied power to the um, Camp Century in Greenland. And it was, you know, the fuel rods were only, let's see if I can get it, you know, this big. They weren't very big. They were, they were a couple of feet long. They had, you know, a couple of dozen fuel, fuel elements, and uh, it produced 2,000 kilowatts total. But that was enough to supply... You know, a research station that had 50 to 100 people under the ice. So it was pretty impressive. And you don't have to have big because it's light, light water. You know, that's a myth. Light water can be very small. Okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, now, in terms of the, the video I'm working on, one of the narratives I'm trying to pursue is whether or not uh, the current administration is, on, is sort of on the ball with... Um, different nuclear options like uh, I'm, I'm mostly talking about molten salt reactors in the video and uh, I don't know what's what's your take on the administration's knowledge of stuff like this Did, are they aware and they're just not pursuing it because it's not necessarily the best technical option right now or however you want to try to take that from the top right the, the administration like many people very few people understand all the options that are available in nuclear energy. Uh, sorry, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, just one second. Okay, uh, buddy. Oh, I don't even know where this came from. Okay, uh, sorry, if I can get you to take that from the top. I, I actually have a trouble hearing when he's crying. I understand. Um, very few people understand all the options that are available in nuclear energy. Uh, it's... It's a complicated subject. It's a subject that is actually quite new. Uh, nobody in the world knew that a self-sustained uh, fission chain reaction was even possible uh, up until somewhere around 1938. Uh, and the first one wasn't actually uh, built. The, the first uh, chain reaction experiment was built and, and operated in December of 1942. Now, people think that was a long time ago, but for, for me... My mother was a teenager in 1942. She's still alive and, and kicking. Uh, I know a good friend of mine was an adult uh, during the time that the Manhattan Project was going. He was actually assigned. He was one of the engineers working on the Manhattan Project. So that's pretty s short time ago, one generation uh, removed from when the very discoveries were made. Uh, there are still people around today who can... Uh, talk about having served with uh, Glenn Seaborg or, or some of the, the real pioneers in this technology. So it, does, does the administration understand all the options available? No. Does, does anybody really understand clearly the fact that nuclear energy is a completely disruptive technology that, that uh, can change the, the basis for society? Because we essentially have over the last 150 years, developed a fossil fuel-based industrial economy. And that fossil fuel-based economy requires movement of massive amounts of, of burnable materials from places where they, they were formed by nature millions of years ago 
into the, the tanks of, of automobiles or into the furnaces for boilers or whatever. And, and the, the amount of material moved for that economy is incredible. And here, here comes along a, a technology where a tiny pellet, let's see if I've got, I've got one right here. Okay, this is one of the, the cards that the American Nuclear Society uh, used to hand out. It has a little simulated pellet right there. See that little teeny pe pellet? That's a real size of a fuel pellet for a light water reactor that contains as much energy as a ton of coal or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas or 107 gallons of oil in that tiny little pellet. Now imagine how little impact this has on you know moving around moving material around the world to get energy out but imagine being the one who sells the ton of coal or the 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas or the 147 gallons of oil in competition with a, a material that's that energy dense and by the way that energy density that I'm talking about is using current light water technology, where we only burn about 5% of the mass of this material. After, you know, four and a half years, we take this, the fuel rods that contain these pellets out, and they still contain 95% of the original material. They look almost exactly the same as they did when they went in. Now, they, they have a completely different characteristics. They're quite radioactive, but most of the radioactivity is something that decays away within a few hundred years. Uh, it's just magical and completely disruptive to the whole industrial economy. So there's a lot of people that hate nuclear energy because it threatens their business. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I also think that there's, a, there's definitely sort of um, economic incentives to dislike it uh, from a lot of people, but a lot of that is also organic, right? Like I know tons of people that are scared or hate nuclear and they don't have any economic incentive to do so. That's true. They, they, people may not have a, a, an economic incentive to dislike nuclear. They think they don't have an economic incentive. But what they have is a whole lifetime of listening to the messages coming from the establishment, which includes the advertiser-supported media, telling them they should be afraid of something that they can't even find. Most people can never find a storage site for used nuclear fuel. It's not something that impacts their life. Why are they afraid of something that has never killed anybody, never caused an injury? You know, to me, you have to be sold that fear. That fear doesn't happen automatically. People have been had repetitive messages that say, you should be afraid of nuclear. Now, some of those repetitive messages, quite honestly, came from People in the defense establishment of the United States, in the, in the early days of, of having a, uh, the only nuclear weapons capability in the world, the U.S. Peop, uh, weapons folks had a real incentive to make people completely afraid of their magical new weapon. You know, if you've got a new weapon, you want people to be afraid of it, right? You don't want to have to use it. You want to... to pretend or, or or message people and say, hey, this is the ultimate. You have to be afraid. If I let this thing go, I'm going to kill you all. I'm, I'm, I'm going to you know, have your children and will bear the, the fruits of me getting mad at you. So don't let me get mad at you. I'll, you know, I'll be nice to you and I'll, I'll give you the Marshall Plan or whatever, but hey, don't mess with us because we've got this magical weapon. Quite honestly, it's propaganda. You know? Nagasaki and Hiroshima definitely were problems. But they were no worse off than Tokyo after being firebombed. The big difference, the thing that scared the heck out of the establishment was the fact that Nagasaki and Hiroshima took one airplane, one weapon. Didn't take a whole horde of, of uh, aircraft with thousands of supporting uh, cast and pilots and everything else going over and dropping firebombs like it did at Dresden or Tokyo. It was one aircraft carrying one bomb, boom, and uh, that that's a little bit scary. If your strength comes from the fact that you've got the world's greatest manufacturing enterprise, you know you've got this ability to create, you know, thousands of aircraft, and that's what 
people thought the, the strength of America was. You know, all of a sudden things changed completely. You've got the ability to release a massive amount of energy from a very small mass. Let's let's get on to China because that's the that's probably one of the most important things for me to catch. Is uh, could you give me a, a rundown um, on how Chinese basically managed managed to capture the rare earths manufacturing sector? Like, there's a story there, and I kind of know it, but uh, I actually need someone to articulate it for me. And if you can do that, that'd be great. Well, one of the things about rare earths is uh, they're not uncommon. The, the whole term rare earth is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, there are places all around the world have deposits of rare earth metals. The, the problem with rare earths is that they are often uh, a complex chemical uh, makeup in a mineral base that has a lot of, of different chemicals in it. In order to, get to extract pure versions of the various materials in rare earths, you have to do a lot of chemistry, um, and the cost is high if you want to not produce. If you are willing to accept a, a lot of pollution and do things quick and dirty, you can lower the cost of production considerably. And that's what the Chinese have done to capture the world's rare earth market is they're willing to accept an awful lot more pollution than others, so they can take shortcuts, which lowers the cost. Any five-year-old or 10-year-old can tell you that if you do a job halfway and you don't have to clean up after yourself, you can do it a lot easier and a lot cheaper. So the Chinese have done that. They have accepted a, a very high level of pollution, uh, a very high level of industrial uh, risk for their workers, their rare earth sector is certainly not anything that we would want to accept here in the U.S. The, the way that they treat the people involved, you know, I, I believe much of the rare earth production in China is actually done in Mongolia, which for a Chinese person is uh, all, often, you know, they look at Mongolians as a little bit lesser people. So they don't mind the fact that that the protections are very low. So it's easy to capture a worldwide industry if you're willing to accept the, the lower quality um, of not the product, but the lower quality of the whole manufacturing enterprise. Um, that's not hard. There's lots of rare earths around the world. It's just going to cost more. You'll have to be willing to pay a higher price if you want plenty of rare earths from a production. Hey, Rod, sorry, I get, I'm, this is okay. a little bit more than I was expecting. I think what's going to happen is the audio is going to bounce back to you at your end and get caught anyway. Um. I, can call, I, can, I can call back another time. It's, it's funny how, um, I guess, wind and sun seem to be taking on the role that I would, wind and sun seem to be, uh, in the people's minds where I would think nuclear power would be today. Um, so you're saying that uh, nuclear is a new industry. Well, uh, wind and solar is crazy new, and yet um, when people think of energy, that's probably something that pops in their head just as frequently as nuclear would. Wind and solar, can, how can people think of wind and solar as new, except they've been told that it's new? Uh, you know, I visited Holland a couple of years ago, and they had all these old windmills. What's the difference between a windmill and a wind turbine? except for a little bit larger size, same machinery, same concept, capturing the wind's energy. I used to sail, uh, and I know a lot about the history of sailing ships. We've been capturing wind for a long time, but we stopped using sailing ships for commercial propulsion because it was just too darn unreliable. You couldn't predict the schedule. You know, when sailing ships lost out to very primitive coal-fired ships in the 1850s. Um, you know, so the idea that wind and solar are new is crazy. It's, it's a marketing ploy. I believe it's a marketing ploy by folks that don't really want us to solve the energy challenges we have. In other words, those people who are making a lot of money, uh, quote, supplying the energy sources we have today and, and certainly not solving our problem. Oh, it's definitely there's some uh, incredible marketing going on there. 
but it's mm -hmm. uh, it's just inter interesting that probably I can imagine the industry that gets helped the more than nuclear by wind and solar marketing is perhaps the petrochemical industry. Uh, and the petrochemical industry, if you take a look at the magazines, take a look at the the, the television pub, uh, advertising, you'll see that the petrochemical industry, the hydrocarbon industry, spends an awful lot of money advertising that they believe in, in wind and the sun and, and that, you know, BP is beyond petroleum and they're they're building windmills around the world and, and you know, Exxon is talking about uh, growing algae to produce power, you know, all kinds of alternatives. You'll never hear a hydrocarbon company talking about nuclear. Their belief is if they ignore nuclear, maybe they can make it go away, at least publicly and privately. I believe that many folks in the hydrocarbon industry, or at least some key folks in the hydrocarbon industry, recognize very clearly that nuclear is a competitor that has to be suppressed because they cannot compete against our power source. I'll show you again this little pellet. Okay, if this is a three by five card and the pellet's right here. Okay, that's a simulated uh, nuclear fuel pellet that contains, if, if it was real, contains as much energy as a ton of coal, 147 gallons of oil, or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. How can the hydrocarbon industry allow that little pellet to be used effectively on the marketplace? It's, it takes very little. Uh, I mean, I can carry this around. You can put you know, a guy in a backpack could carry as much energy in a backpack, the same size that I carry on the Appalachian Trail, as a, as a super tanker. Okay, a 50 pound backpack has as much energy as a super tanker if it's used effectively. So the the economics of the, the it's a wildly disruptive technology. It's like the difference between using an abacus and using a dual core Intel microchip. You know, it just wildly changed the dynamics of energy. And, uh, you know, so the, the oil and gas industry was heavily involved in the early days of nuclear energy. And I think they recognized they could not capture the, the high value part of the energy industry of the nuclear industry like they did with the hydrocarbons. If you're building a natural gas plant, for example, a natural gas plant can be built fairly cheaply, say $1,000 per kilowatt of capacity. A nuclear plant may cost four or five times that much. But the difference is once you build a natural gas plant, say something that, that burns natural gas in a gas turbine, there's very little choice of fuel that you can use. You can use natural gas or you can use distillate oil, which is more expensive. And you can't burn coal in that kind of plant. It just doesn't work. You can't use it as a nuclear plant. So you're limited. You're addicted to natural gas. And the person or the company or the entity that owns a natural gas plant will keep buying gas. And the gas price or the cost of the gas will roughly be 90 to 93 percent of the cost of the whole plant operation. That means that paying salaries, paying back the loan, paying for the, the distribution, paying for the spare parts, all that is in between 7 and 10 percent of the cost. Everything else, all the other cost, also all the other revenue, goes to the guy that supplies it with the gas, with the fuel. You know, that the hydrocarbon industry knows those economics. They captured that high value part of the energy equation in those kinds of plants. You know, when you, people don't, uh, there's an old myth that runs around the, the, the web that has been running around since before the web existed. It says, you know, the, the oil companies got together and they, they came up with a way to, to suppress this magical invention that gave you a 100-mile-per-gallon carburetor. And it's an old myth, and it's, it's dumb. The oil companies didn't do that. The oil companies worked with the car companies to encourage people to want big cars. And you can't move a big car with a high, you know, high mileage. It's just the physics is 
you want to move something big, you need a lot of power. You need a lot of energy. So the, that I, I definitely agree that the oil companies encourage the car companies to encourage Americans to want big cars and, and SUVs and vans and all that other nonsense. Okay. But if you were to be able to power an automobile with a nuclear engine, you could build a car without really stressing the technology. It would get somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 million miles for a gallon of uranium. And I wrote an article about that 15 years ago. And certainly it's hard. You can't build a nuclear-powered automobile. But you can, and I can testify to this from personal experience, you can build nuclear-powered ships. And ships around the world consume somewhere around 6 to 8% of the oil that the world uses every day gets burned in a ship that could be being propelled by a nuclear reactor. And I know that we can produce ships because I've been on them. I served underwater on ships. The U.S. Navy has been using nuclear power to, produ- to propel ships around the ocean since 1955. The Brits know how to do it, the French, the Chinese, the Russians. We've all built nuclear-powered ships. You know, they, they happen to be mostly have been warships, but that doesn't stop the technology. You know, the difference in an engine for a ship is an engine for a ship. It doesn't matter whether it's a warship or not. Um, and the, the characteristics of those ships are that they can propel ships around the world far less expensively than filling ships full of oil. But the governments that have allowed those or helped those ships be built will not allow the technology to be released into the commercial market for whatever reason. Um, But, you know, we can and we do build nuclear power plants in places where trains are electrified. The Northeast U.S., for example, has a lot of electric trains. The city of New York City, the the subway system, gets about a third to a half of its power from the Indian Point nuclear power plant. You know, we can move people around using nuclear power. We do all the time. They do it in France. They do it in Germany, where the the nuclear plants are supplying electric trains. You know, we can we can do all kinds. Of, we can also use the heat from nuclear reactors instead of the heat from burning coal, we can use that to produce synthetic uh, hydrocarbon, add hydrogen to carbon, either in, say, a heavy oil or a coal type environment where you're, you're already, we use a lot of hydrogen in that market, but we could do that and use the heat from a nuclear reactor to make it even more efficient and cleaner. A lot of reasons why we don't mainly because the folks that sell the other input materials like selling those input materials. They make money selling those input materials. They have political power because they sell those input materials. And uh, so nuclear has to figure out some ways to align with the right friends. We have to recognize that the world has only got about, oh, I don't know, three, five, seven percent of the world is involved in the hydrocarbon business. All the rest of us are hydrocarbon customers. We all have a motive for reducing our consumption of hydrocarbons and reducing the amount of money that we take out of our pocket and give to uh, Chevron and BP and Shell and, and ExxonMobil and all those other companies and figure out ways to drive down the price of those fuels. What's the best way to drive down the price of anything is to increase the supply. If you have a lot, of, if you help nuclear to succeed, you will increase the supply of energy. That will drive down the price of energy, and it will displace uh, energy demand coming from selling natural gas or selling coal or selling oil. I, I had a conversation with uh, the Green Party leader of Canada. And she was very clear that uh, the, the path to uh, addressing climate change was uh, reducing any energy consumption 
not increasing production. She said that we waste a lot of energy and that's, that is the primary approach that the, the Green Party would take is uh, ensuring that industry and people, increasing efficiency in Canada. What, oh. Gordon. Just double checking my internet connection. Hopefully that was a urine because I uh, it seems to be working here. No, you're fine. I we had a, a really brief power outage, uh, just enough to cause my cause my computer to go off. Her thinking is that we're we should deal with this through a um, energy consumption perspective, and we should try to make everything more efficient. Um, do you have a response to that? There are a lot of folks over the years that have been uh, trying to make people feel guilty about using energy. People like Amory Lovins uh, and, and many folks in the, uh, the you know the official Green parties have have talked about uh, reducing energy consumption as the the path to a, 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 some sort of energy utopia down the road. And uh, I, my personal belief is that it's none of their business how much energy I use. If I want to drive a, a speedboat around the lake, that's my business, not theirs. Uh, as long as I am able to not uh, harm other folks by my energy use, then I should be able to use what I need. I, if I want to live in a house with lots and lots of glass along the back of the house because I have a gorgeous mountain view out the back and I don't want to put any insulating curtains on it and I, and I want to enjoy that view when I first wake up in the morning, even if it's a little bit chilly outside, if I want to have that view comfortable in the, in the evening when it's hot, sticky in the summertime, hey, that's my choice. Uh, you know, the energy is something that, that makes life better for people. Using energy is, is, is good and can be fun. I, I travel around the world a fair amount. Um, I, I don't overuse because I don't have a whole lot of money. I, I buy what I can afford. I, you know, don't buy what I can't afford. Uh, so I, I don't understand the notion that the solution to energy use is to reduce our use, particularly when I know that there are probably half of the world's population uses no commercial sources of energy at all. Uh, you know, they, they gather what they can carry on, as firewood or, or animal dung, and they burn it in, in uncontrolled indoor fires and expose their children to the pollution of, of that uh, activity. They do that because they need the heat from a fire to convert things like wheat or grains or rice into something edible for human beings. You can't eat that stuff raw. You have to cook it. You have to cook meat if you want to eat it healthily because otherwise it could be carrying all kinds of, of disease and things like that. So. You know, we use energy for many reasons, and, and yes, some people uh, seem to have an abundance and overconsume, but that's their choice. They're paying for that energy. I, I, think, uh, we're, I'm, I think we're talking maybe about two different things. I mean, uh, uh, efficiency, right? I mean, an incandescent light versus a fluorescent bulb. Um, is there a series of fixes we could do that basically we're not, we're not really destroying our quality of life, we're just wasting less energy? You know, I, I have an interesting view of the incandescent versus uh, fluorescent uh, battle. Um, you know, incandescent light bulbs are, are actually produce a very nice source of light. They're, they're friendly to the, to the eye and to the ear. They don't hum. They don't produce an annoying buzz when you turn them on. They come on instantly. Um, the light spectrum is very good, and they can last a long time. I mean, I... I know that people who have talked about fluorescent light bulbs say, well, they're so much longer lasting. And, and I, can, I can testify to you that I have seen incandescent light bulbs that were burning when Thomas Edison was still alive. And they're burning, or they were burning when I visited the Thomas Edison Museum in the, uh, I don't know, maybe 1998, 99. Uh, and Thomas Edison died in 1931, if I remember the date correctly. Uh, those light bulbs can be very long-lasting. Um, 
it's all it's all a matter of how well you manufacture them and how tightly you seal them, and in some cases how you you handle them. You turn them on and you leave them running. Maybe and I think in in the case of the light bulbs I saw, they were actually uh, direct current light bulbs, DC, not AC, so they didn't have the cycling power that an incandescent light bulb had. The, dis, the disadvantage, people say, well, they, they convert a lot of their energy into heat, and, and it's not light, so it's not good. Well, if you're using incandescent light bulbs inside your home in the wintertime, well, you need heat as much as you need light anyway. So it's not wasted energy. You're using uh, the good features of an incandescent light bulb, and you happen to be adding heat to the indoor air, which you'd be adding anyway, one way or another. Uh, is, so my belief is that sometimes the marketing about fluorescent light bulbs comes from those companies that would much prefer to sell you a $5 fluorescent, compact fluorescent light bulb than to sell you a 50 cent incandescent light bulb. You know, even though they manufacture both kinds, they get a lot more revenue per unit if they sell the fluorescents and if they sell the incandescents. And it happens that some very large and powerful companies are involved in selling fluorescent light bulbs. And they couldn't do it very well by, you know, encouraging people or marketing to people. So they turned to the government and said, hey, why don't you guys force people to buy fluorescent light bulbs? And those companies are folks like General Electric and Siemens and a few others that, hey, you know, I, if they want to sell me on fluorescent, make a fluorescent that actually meets my needs <clears throat> as well as an incandescent light bulb. I like incandescent light bulbs. In many cases, I use fluorescent. I have compact fluorescents in various uh, places in my house, particularly on my front porch where I leave the light burning all night long. But for you know certain parts of my house, I want a light that turns on instantly. When I go into a room, I want to turn it on instantly. I want to get full light, and I want to walk out of the room and be able to turn it off. Um, and and I, that light doesn't consume all that much energy because I only use it part of the time. But right now, you know, the federal government has stepped in and said, I can't keep my fluorescent, my incandescent light bulbs, and, or can't get them anymore sometime down the road. And, and I hope that that law gets overturned. It's a dumb law, and, and people's view of efficiency all depends. You know, fluorescents are not magically better. They have some better qualities. They have some worse qualities. And there's no reason to force people to buy a fluorescent. And particularly, I imagine that there, you know, I, I've worked with some very uh, low-income folks. I used to run a factory where some of my workers, you know, were, were living paycheck to paycheck, uh, making just barely over minimum wage, hardworking, good people. But, you know, telling that kind of person, you can't go and buy a, a 50-cent light bulb. You need to go buy this $4.5 light bulb. They're just wrong. That's not something the government should be doing. So anyway, that's my thought. I'm just going to get a, a quick uh, counterpoint in here. But I mean, I, I would assume that the, the line of thought would be um, just the same way you mandate higher mile per gallons in cars. It's like if, uh, if they were just mandating how efficient a light bulb had to be, eventually you'd be moving the whole market towards more efficient bulbs. And there wouldn't really be that much of a downside other than the the progression from the less efficient to the more efficient bulbs over time. And hopefully the, the market would then be sorting itself out based on performance and not just uh, um, efficiency. I mean, full spectrum performance. When you, uh, and again, so if you are mandating full, you want to have better performance, the market generally does a pretty good job at helping uh, people making very complex decisions with a variety of measures of effectiveness. Efficiency is only one, energy efficiency is only one measure of effectiveness if you're going to buy a light bulb. You know, what does the light look like? Is it bright white light that is the kind of light that makes it easy to read a book? Is it somewhat muted um, light that is not so easy for reading but maybe better for something else? Is it light that comes on instantly? Or is it light that I have to wait for three or four minutes before it's at full, uh, full intensity? Um, is it a light bulb that's quiet? I mean, I am fairly sensitive to the fact that 
fluorescent light bulbs hum, particularly those uh, light bulbs where the ballast is not well tuned to the light. You can walk into a room, you can hear them humming. I used to live in, uh, you know, submarines were all fluorescents. Uh, we, re- we use fluorescent for various reasons compared to incandescence, but fluorescents weren't perfect. I, I had to spend, no, I probably had one man, man day, one of my full time equivalents on board a submarine who was constantly fixing fluorescent light fixtures. Now it wasn't the same guy all the time, but we, we had to keep replacing ballast. We rewire. We did all kinds of things to keep those lights running. Now these were lights that were on all the time. So that happens. But then we also had to dispose of the tubes. You know, the tubes of a fluorescent light bulb are not something that's as easy to get rid of as an incandescent light bulb. They have materials inside them which are not appropriate for just throwing into a dump. You have to dispose them carefully. If they break, you have another issue. You know, you, you now have put the, the, the material inside of a fluorescent has mercury inside. There's all kinds of things that are not perfect about fluorescents. And the, the advantage they have is they are more energy efficient if you don't have any desire for the heat coming out. If you want the heat anyway, then they're not any more energy efficient. Uh, when it comes to mileage on a car, I, you know, I drive one of the highest mileage small cars available. I drive a Volkswagen Jetta turbo diesel injected TDI. I've been averaging about 47 miles per gallon since I've owned the car. I've got 230,000 miles on the car. So it, it's, it, that is a good car for me. It, it, it meets my needs. I only drive myself. I don't usually have a family with me because my children are grown and gone. So that's an appropriate car. I can put four adults in it and drive back and forth to work. I've done that commuting. Uh, it worked fine. We couldn't bring very much stuff with us. You know, we could all bring briefcases and, and whatnot. That was okay. We'd bring a gym bag. But that car was okay for that task. But there was a time in my, you know, life when I needed a minivan to be able to carry my children, the, the stuff that my kids wanted to bring, their, their friends when we were going to a ball game, you know, the, the, the gear for a softball team. Hey, a minivan was the right tool for that task. I couldn't get a minivan that would make everybody happy about the gas mileage because a minivan's a big box. In, in, in my case, I, I had Volkswagens and Aerostars and that kind of stuff. Um, I know people that work for a living who need a pickup truck. They need to be able to carry their stuff in a pickup truck. Well, you can't carry a lot of stuff in an in a automobile or a vehicle that gets 40 miles per gallon. You know, it just doesn't work. The physics requires you to expend energy to move weight from place to place. That's a simple matter of physics. You cannot do that with a high mileage vehicle. The way you get high miles is you reduce the weight of the vehicle. And you know you can only reduce the weight so much when the purpose of the vehicle is to carry weight. So that's my, my rant on that. Efficiency is not a source of energy. It's simply a way to use less energy. And yes, there are, there are people who are grossly inefficient. There's no reason for a single driver to drive a Hummer back and forth to work. It just doesn't make sense. But, you know, it's not my job to tell that person he's being stupid. I prefer the, the other way. I prefer the European method. Make gas, gasoline at the retail level cost enough to discourage that kind of use. And I don't mean let the oil companies make more money on gas. I mean let all of us make more money on gas by taxing the heck out of it. I don't mind that. I don't have a problem with taxes on uh, material that is somewhat limited in, in, in uh, capacity around the world. Oil is, is a finite resource, and it, it is worth, it's worthwhile to discourage people from overusing oil, but to do that by making the price go up. Uh, you know, Americans are really good about making choices that save them money uh, in their pocketbook. And, and again, I don't mind taxing gasoline and raising the price of gas because I, that means that the benefit of that high price gas gets distributed amongst all of us and goes into better roads and better schools and better libraries and all kinds of stuff. 
and, and doesn't go into the pocket of folks at the top of oil companies. Well, can, can I actually get uh, just a question? What kind of policies would you implement if you, say, say the, um, your blog had enough influence that you could just dictate policy? What would you, what do you think the, the best kind of, what kind of stuff would you do as the, the best low-hanging fruit ways to improve the economy and the impact on the environment and everything? Well, I, I never make any uh, uh, presumption of trying to tell anybody how to, do, how to live their life. I, I really do believe in, in freedom and democracy and the right of free speech. And the reason I blog is that the right of free speech demands people to engage in conversation. And I really like the blogging format and, and the ability to accept comments and let people make their, their thoughts heard. But my philosophy is that energy is readily available around the world. The amount of energy that's available from even burning the 0.5% of uranium that we use in light water reactors is can be a massive amount of energy, uh, enough to disrupt the market if it's allowed to uh, play based on objective safety and environmental rules. You know, you can produce almost no waste at all that gets distributed in the environment from a light water reactor. Now, if, if I say that and talking about just the amount of energy in U-235, the very tiny portion of uranium that we use, just imagine what I would be saying if I said, you know, I also like fast reactors and I like thorium reactors and I like the ability to make use of all that other material, the U-238 and the thorium-232. We could have so much energy, an abundance of energy, that it would drive the price down to the point where the only oil we'd be taking out of the ground would be the easy-to-get-to oil that comes out of places where oil is already being extracted, and, and there's not going to be any more environmental devastation from using that oil as there, and then there already is. We would stop going into high-risk, high-cost areas like off, deep offshore. We would not even think about going into the Arctic where you know extracting oil is extremely costly, dangerous, uh, you know, environmentally hazardous, um, and just hard. It's, it's a hard job. The people that go up and, and do that work are going to be, would be doing really hard work that puts their lives at risk. And, and I would venture to say it would be almost 100% males that would get involved in that activity. Um, it wouldn't be providing jobs for half of the population because no woman in her right mind would go up into the, you know, Arctic to, to drill for oil. It's just, it's crazy. Um, you know, we would stop blowing tops up of mountains because that's an expensive way to get the coal. We would stop moving coal from Wyoming to South Florida because, you know, why bother to move that much weight that far? You know, there's all kinds of things we'd stop doing if we simply allowed nuclear to compete on objective measures. You know, lots of folks around the world have been you know, scared out of their mind by a bunch of idiots talking about the, the hazards of Fukushima. And the reality is that, yes, there are people who have been evacuated and displaced by government decisions. There has not been one single radiation-related casualty in the four or five months since the Fukushima reactors were inundated by a tsunami and knocked offline. Yes, those reactors were damaged. It, the most recent news that I saw was that there was essentially one single design flaw, which was the, the, the key cause. It was a, a power transfer switch that was the way you get power from the emergency diesel generators into the reactor control systems and the cooling systems, and that power transfer switch was in a non-seismic building for five of the reactors and was in a, in a place that could be submerged by a large tsunami, and so it was wiped out. So even though that there was the potential for bringing in emergency diesel generators, there was no way to hook them in to the power uh, system at the plants for several days. It takes a while to rewire big cables 
and big transfer switches and that kind of stuff. And and you, they, they simply couldn't move the water because there just wasn't any way to connect electricity. Uh, the other five reactors in the Fukushima prefecture were built just a few years later, and people recognized that that power transfer switch was a key component that needed better protection. And so the reactors uh, number six at Fukushima Diachi and all the reactors at Fukushima Diani didn't have that power transfer switch problem, and none of them had, uh, you know, significant damage from the, the tsunami. And fortunately, reactor number five at Fukushima Diachi was shared a power system with number six and could get power. So number five didn't have a problem either. It was only one through four that had problems. And they were the earliest. You know, we, in other words, basically we figured out how to prevent that problem sometime around 1971, 72. And then the one thing that we didn't do, the, the Japanese didn't do, was go back and fix what was a weakness in early systems because they thought, you know, we probably can live with this for now. It's, it's okay. It's not really, you know, we, we've operated the plants for 40 years. And it's not been a problem before. It came, it came to be a problem. They never fixed it. It, it was the real Achilles heel that led to that. But again, even with all that challenge, the reactors kept the vast majority of the material inside the pressure vessel. It didn't get out, didn't harm anybody, and, you know, it certainly is a lot better than what happened to the oil and gas and coal infrastructure in the same area that got hit by the tsunami. And a lot of the contamination that really is going to cause health effects came from the overturned automobiles, from the the lead acid storage batteries from the factories that got inundated, all that other nonsense. You know, there's a lot of things that happened there, and and it was the the uh, marketing push to, to to tell people that they really ought to be afraid of the nuclear plants, and, and you know, in a way, they aren't. They're not the problem. Well, is is it not a valid concern though that? Uh these the plants are by and large built by private corporations. There's always the the incentive to compete on cost. I guess I'm talking about some kind of fantasy land where these things are still getting built. Like, um, how can you guarantee uh, 100% reliability and safety if if maybe that's what people like are expecting from nuclear? Like, uh, how how do you how do you actually make it so that uh, we don't have these problems in the first place? I can't guarantee anything. I can tell you that the nuclear power plants that have been built in the last 50 years have an incredibly uh, uh, a safety record that one should be incredibly proud of because people man, like me uh, who have been involved in operating these plants have not been motivated just by money. You know, we've been motivated by things that motivate all engineers, which is doing a good job uh, producing uh, resilient equipment that can withstand casualties. Uh, yes, there are always the accountants and the, and the investors who want to somehow make more money magically without doing any more work. Uh, but there's an awful lot of folks involved in, in engineering enterprises who really work hard in and the, the, the oil and gas industry has, is full of good engineers who do a very difficult job of, of containing uh, explosive flammable materials and keeping people as safe as possible. The nuclear industry has done even better. You know, commercial nuclear energy around the world has a very good safety record. Even if you include Chernobyl, you know, the number of deaths from nuclear power plant accidents is on is less than 100 around the world ever. That's pretty good, considering that just last year we had an oil and gas, I mean, a natural gas explosion at, a, at the clean energy facility in Middletown, Connecticut that killed seven people. We had the uh, coal dust and methane explosion at the Upper Big Branch coal mine, which killed 29 people. We had the methane explosion in the uh, Macondo oil well, which is also known as Deepwater Horizon, that killed 11 people. Uh, we had the uh, San Bruno fire, which was a natural gas pipeline 
running underneath a neighborhood, not even in a safe area, underneath a neighborhood, and it blew up suddenly and killed about eight people and destroyed 50 homes. You know, the world is not a risk-free place. I, you know, and I, I hate to, you know, I'm not talking down to people. I want people to recognize, look around the world, look and see what risks there are in the world, and say, how does that compare with the risk of a, a, an accident at a nuclear plant that really does have an impact? And, and we have done a, a really careful job of surrounding nuclear plants with lots of layers, lots of protection, lots of things that slow down the impact and allow people to move out of the way if necessary. And yes, the plants may be damaged, but in general, the materials, the, the dangerous materials stay inside and, you know, people are pretty safe. Absolutely, perfectly, 100% safe? No, but Close enough for gov- well, close enough for any work. You know, the the risk from a nuclear plant is infinitesimal compared to the risk of taking a shower. You, know, you could slip and fall. You know, the, the risk of walking down your staircase. Obviously, you can slip and fall, knock your head out. You know, all kinds of things that are risky uh, parts of living. Having a nuclear plant anywhere nearby, you know, is, is fine. I've lived within 200 feet of a nuclear reactor. Felt very good, safe. You know, took my family on board whenever I could. You know, I most nukes, most nuclear professionals live very close to their plants, so they can be there in, in relatively quick order. They don't have a, a problem with their families. You know, a recent report by uh, the Associated Press talked about all of the population growth that has been seen in the areas near nuclear power plants, and and they tried to spin it as something that should be of concern because it makes it, quote, harder to evacuate. But the reality is that the population growth has occurred around nuclear power plant sites because they're pretty darn nice places to live. The power plant provides good jobs. It doesn't pollute the environment lo- locally. It, you know, it's an emission-free power source from a local perspective. Um, it, it's quiet. It, uh, they pay high taxes, so they, you know, there's lots of nice libraries and good school systems and there's a whole bunch of well-educated people that move into town when you got a nuclear plant around. You know, the, the engineers that are there demand good schools. They, they participate in activities. They teach uh, youth sports events. They all kinds of things that are good about having a nuclear plant around, which is why the communities grow. You know, I, I used to live near the Calvert Cliffs facility in, in Maryland. And before that facility moved in, there was very little economy. There was almost no jobs in southern Maryland. There was farming, and that was about it. Now the Calvert County area is just a nice place to live. It's it's really a community place, comfortable, and lots of people. And so when they're thinking about building the number three plant, they got to pay attention to the fact that the roads need improvement and, and that there's some issues associated with it. But it doesn't mean that that they should stop building. It's just got to, you got to figure out building a nuclear plant in a higher population area. Is, uh, no, please don't hang up. Hey. What was that? I don't know what happened. Oh, okay. I was like, ah, your power surge again. No, no, nah. All of a sudden, I... I I had finished my rant and I said, what's the big deal? And then all of a sudden it just stopped. <laughs> so, so a lot of people have talked about the fact that China has kind of captured the world's rare earth metal market. And uh, one of the things that confuses people is that rare earth metals are not really all that rare. Um, it's just a term that got applied to them. Rare earth metals tend to uh, occur in complicated uh, metal or complicated ore forms. There's a lot of materials that are inside, and part of it is because those materials often come from the decay of things like thorium or uranium. So they're also, rare earths also tend to be um, in formations that have a lot of, of lightly radioactive material like thorium or uranium. Separating out the rare earths, all of the specific components that you want, into high enough purity forms often require some complex chemical uh, treatment. And that chemical treatment 
uh, can be a fairly high cost if you do it in such a way that you care about the environment and care about your workers. Uh, the Chinese suppliers figured out what every 10-year-old already knows, that it, you can do things a lot easier if you don't bother to clean up after yourself. So they captured the market by offering lower prices that were coming from uh, sources where they were taking shortcuts and not cleaning up after themselves, not doing uh, their mining and, and processing in a form that would meet standards in other places around the world. So by offering low prices for these materials, the Chinese were able to essentially get everybody else in the world to shut down their production because they couldn't compete and meet the standards in the places where they were. You know, the U.S. has some really, you know, we, we had a fair portion of the rare earth market for a while, but the, com the folks that were mining that material simply couldn't compete on price basis with the Chinese. And, you know, we have a lot of people in the U.S. who, who can only make a choice of, you know, if you got something at $5 and something at $7, they're going to buy the $5 product every time. Uh, it doesn't matter what the back end uh, implications are, they're going to buy the cheap product. So, you know, that's how China has captured the rare earth market. And they even, even within China, you know, the, the folks that are doing the rare earth mining are not, you know, the ethnic Chinese. They're, you know, most of the rare earth mining is done in Mongolia, which is in a region of, of China, under Chinese control, which is populated by people that many people, many folks in China view as somewhat lesser folks than, than Chinese. So even there, they, they offloaded this nasty uh, uh, environmental challenge to somebody else, you know, you know, and just, anyway, that's, that's my philosophy. I, I know that we can do, we can, we're not dependent really on Chinese for rare earth metals on a long-term basis, but we have to be willing to pay more for them. And that has implications for some people who really, you know, want the wind and the sun to be a better source of energy because the rare earth metals are important components in the magnets in a wind turbine and in the uh, silicon wafers or whatever that they are used for uh, solar photovoltaic uh, and for transformers and all those other components of the complex methods of capturing diffuse and unreliable energy sources and making them moderately competitive. Uh, you need a lot of rare earth. So, you know, the, the folks that are, you know, big into renewable energy sources from a green perspective, you know, they need to look at the rest of the, the um, infrastructure, the rest of the supply chain and say, do I really want cheaper windmills if the way that the wind turbines are cheaper is because they use permanent magnet uh, generators that are produced cheaper because they get cheaper rare earth metals from the Chinese, which are not really handling the environment very well because they're only doing half the job of cleaning it up. How, how would you um, say they captured the manufacturing base? Because uh, they managed to leverage that into capturing a lot of manufacturing base from America uh, by putting an export tax on the rare earth metal. Is that something you're familiar with, or is... Yeah, they did that fairly recently. But uh, the first thing that they did, I mean, it may have been a strategy, I don't know, but the first thing that the Chinese did was that they sold rare, rare earth metals to the world market at a low cost without an export tax. Enough, for long enough so that the rare earth mining operations around the world basically went out of business. And it doesn't, it's not something you can turn on a dime. If, you know, you're a rare earth miner and you've got a business and every year you're losing market share to the Chinese and you start to lose money in your mind and you finally make the hard decision, I'm going to shut down production because I simply can't afford to compete. You know, you have to get rid of all your people. You have equipment that gets retired. You do all things. It'll take you a long time to, to restart that enterprise. Um, once you go out of business. So the Chinese got to the point where they had captured the market, and then they said, well, you know, now all of you are coming to our door to buy our rare earths, um, and, and we, we want to use these 
to improve our own manufacturing enterprise. So we're going to charge an export tax on those rare earths so our manufacturers can buy it cheaper than your manufacturers as long as you're manufacturing in China and then selling a finished product. We don't want to sell the raw material anymore, but we've already sold the raw material long enough to put everybody else out of business. So you don't have any other choice. You, we're the, the suppliers now, at least for, for a while. We're the suppliers. You pay our price with the export tax, and you want to take the railroads back to your place and now try to compete against our manufacturers. You know, it's it's a strategy, it, it, and it's working pretty well. Is the rare earth m- metal industry in America and North America just decimated? Like, what what is there then? Is there nothing? No, I mean, the mine still exists. The, the material is still in the ground. But yes, the, the enterprise was fairly well decimated. The only rare earth mining operation left in the U.S. shut down about eight or ten years ago. But the mine is still here. You just have to restart it. And it's going to take a while. It's not something you can turn on a dime. You got to make the investment. You got to train people again. All the people that were there have hopefully found other jobs. Um, you know, it. You again, the material still here. You can, you can do it. You can't do it cheaply. You can't do it quickly. And so, <clears throat> you know, your choice is for a while, several years. You either pay the Chinese or you don't make the product. Okay, what's the what's the biggest obstacle in your mind to clean power? The biggest obstacle is uh, <clears throat> the, the biggest obstacle to having a clean power system is the fact that um, there's an enormous number of threads that's holding down nuclear energy from uh, expanding and and growing. Nuclear energy is clean. It is safe. It is effective. Uh, you have to throw off some of these threads. You have to make rational regulations. You have to stop charging innovative companies $259 for every bureaucrat hour spent reviewing applications that have to be written to a 4,600-page document and, and, and in general you know, take forever to, to produce simply to fill the fill the bureaucratic need of of slowing down nuclear energy uh, or the bureaucratic desire to slow down nuclear energy. Um, you know, we know how to build small reactors. We used to build small reactors in a short period of time. There, there was one project where the Congress funded the Army's uh, reactor to power the uh, Camp Century in Greenland in May of 1961, the reactor was operating under the ice in Greenland 18 months later. So from funding to complete operation in 18 months, that included designing the system, fabricating in the U.S., doing, marking it with all the, you know, the, the prefab numbers, transporting it up to, to Greenland, digging a hole in the ice, putting it in place in the ice and starting it up, 18 months. You know, that kind of thing right now, even to to go from conception to first power for a new plant is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 years. The, the, the endurance that one has to have to be an investor in nuclear is pretty hard. I mean, I, I started a small modular reactor company in 1993 1996, I had to take another job because we were out of cash. You know, the the, the cost of our competitive uh, fuel source kept dropping the whole time we were in business, and people stopped listening. You know, natural gas prices went from about four or five dollars a million BTU in '93, which was soon after the Gulf War, and they were down to about a dollar eighty per million BTU by '96. Um, you know, the the amount of of money that was available to build a gas plant was huge. I, I went to a conference in 1995-96, and it was an, an independent power producers conference. And there was all kinds of money available uh, from interesting financing sources if I wanted to build a gas-fired plant. The financing sources were uh, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell. They all had cash available to encourage in, independent power producers to build a gas plant. You know, their financing arms had capital. 
um, you know, they were basically paying addicts to, to become more addicted to their product. But yeah, the, the biggest obstacle is we got to figure out a way to get all the people that use energy to recognize that the best way to lower energy costs to improve the environment is to invest in nuclear energy plants, which will last a very long time and produce power very cheaply because the fuel is really compact and really concentrated and really cheap. Commercial nuclear fuel today costs about 60 cents a million BTU. Cheap natural gas, and I'm putting air quotes on that, cheap natural gas costs about $4.50 a million BTU. Um, that math should be pretty easy for people to figure out. You know, if you got fuel that costs one-eighth as much, why don't you use more of it? Especially if it's zero emissions. You know, gas is better than coal. That's about as much as they can say. It's about 400 grams per kilowatt hour from the very most efficient gas plant compared to essentially zero from a nuclear plant. Now, some people dispute the zero. You know, I say, well, hey, you used to go to, su- to sea on a sealed submarine with a nuclear reactor and I didn't have to worry about CO2, so it must be zero to me. They say, well, you gotta fill, you gotta include all of the, the mining and, and fabrication, and all that stuff. People have done the studies. The number is about somewhere between eight grams and 20 grams, depending on your assumptions with, for the amount of energy required to fabricate, enrich, transport, etc. But it's very low. Some studies put it as high as 50 grams, but they're kind of out of the, out of the ballpark and, and assume uh, gases to fusion enrichment powered by coal plants as the enrichment source, which you know nobody builds gases to fusion plants anymore, and 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 they're about tw- they use about 20 times as much energy per unit of enrichment as a centrifuge plant does. So you know, nuclear plants are damn close to or darn close to uh, zero emission, zero pollution. Um, and low cost. So you don't have to give up power. You don't have to, you know, do massive um, power rationing or or force people to do things differently. Like you don't have to force them into small cars. You don't have to force them into incandescent light bulbs. You don't have to force them into things. You simply say you want to buy cheap power that's zero emission or dirty power that has a lot of emissions. It should be an easy choice. I was listening to one of your podcasts since I spoke to you earlier today, and uh, you were talking about uh, there's no mature nuclear industry in America. Could I get you to kind of restate that? And it, I mean, it touches on the fact you guys haven't built a plant in a long time, right? Can you mm-hmm. just run with that? Well, there, there are people that have said that the nuclear industry uh, should not need subsidies because it's, quote, a mature industry. Um, the reality is that the nuclear operating companies uh, have a very specific mission of operating their power plants and selling electricity. But in terms of the supply chain to produce new nuclear plants, and that includes all the way from the designers to the regulators to the manufacturers to the constructors, the U.S. has no existing capability for that enterprise that is ready to produce a lot of plants. We're working to build it back. There are some folks investing. You know, I work for one of those companies that's investing a lot of money in restoring our capacity to build new nuclear plants in the U.S., but the, the, the supply chain really doesn't exist right now. Um, you can't maintain a supply chain if you're not building new things. Uh, for a long period of time, and the U.S. has gone for a very long period of time without building new nuclear power plants. Um, you know, we've had to train a lot of regulators to to learn how to evaluate applications. We've had to retrain people how to submit applications. The regulators keep changing the rules on us and adding things like aircraft impact requirements and a bunch of other things, which I still believe are designed to slow down the the budding interest in nuclear energy. Um, and in the same time, uh, the competitive natural gas industry is doing what I call a price war. Uh, over the last several years, the price of natural gas in the U.S. has been driven down 
by overproduction, uh, often by companies who have a, a much larger source of other revenue called selling oil um, at higher prices. So they're driving down the price of natural gas and hypnotizing the uh, decision makers at utility companies to say, you know, why are we doing this hard stuff of, you know, a, you know, a 10-year project to build new nuclear when we can just put in a gas plant and there's all this cheap gas around? I keep trying to tell them, hey, just look at what happened to the price of natural gas in the United States between 2000 and 2008 when it went from about $2 per million BTU to $14 per million BTU in the space of eight years. Uh, you know, natural gas prices are volatile. They have the ability to go up rather rapidly, particularly if there's a lot more demand and not a lot new su- of new supply. Are there any new technologies you find most uh, interesting, right? So um, you, you've been mostly talking to the strength of light water reactors. What, uh, what other stuff do you follow? I'm, I'm a believer that there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of new things that can happen in uh, nuclear fission technology. I, I'm excited about the small reactors that are produced by, or that are, are planned by folks like Hyperion and Toshiba, you know, tiny reactors that can operate for 8, 10, 20 years at a time on a single fuel load by using uh, metal coolants connected to, to, to steam plants or, or Braden cycle gas turbines. That technology is exciting to me. Using other materials, the, the molten salt reactors are, are very interesting. There's a lot of development to do. A lot of, of you know, those, uh, all the other technologies have to build a supply chain as well. There's not a supply chain of companies ready to build all the spare parts and all of the new parts that you need to produce uh, liquid. Uh, let's see, the, the Hyperion is, I think, a, a lead bismuth uh, coolant. You know the the molten salt for the the got the things that that Kirk Sorensen gets all excited about. Hey, I'm excited about those things too. But I also recognize the manufacturing challenge of getting other companies to get so excited that they're going to invest their own money in building the capacity to build the spare parts that you need. Because it isn't easy to to build things that are going to survive a long time in a radiation uh, chemical environment and also to produce high uh, amounts of power. You know, you've got to spin turbines. You've got to have the materials to do that. You've got to have the, uh, the piping and the valves and the control systems. There's a lot of work to be done. And the, the key is getting a lot of people excited to the point where they're willing to invest a lot of money. Um, and and you got to have some successes to attract more investors. The way that the the tech industry has grown so rapidly is they had some early successes. Some they they produced machines that were had killer apps. You know there were there were folks that were building spreadsheet that that people could run on a on a an, an Apple II that people and or an IBM PC in the early days and said, wow, that is so much better than the way I have to make my calculations. For my business today, I'm going to rush out and I'm going to spend three thousand dollars on a new PC and I'm going to buy some software and and all of a sudden there was money involved here. You know, people said well, that is so much better than what I have right now. In, in the nuclear world, we have the ability to provide something that's so much better. You know, there there are early adopters out there who right now are limited to to operating their economy on on diesel engines. You know, if you go to Guam or to to Bermuda or Jamaica or Hawaii even. The whole economy is run by burning oil to produce electricity. Those, those folks need a power plant that can meet their, mark, their needs. You know, the, I talked about the shipping market. You know, again, those guys are running a, commercial, new, commercial ships are essentially running baseload power plants on distillate fuel. Very expensive stuff. Costs $20 a million BTU instead of 60 cents a million BTU. You know, there's the, the, the nukes, though, need to stop fighting amongst each other and compare their power plants to the com, com real competition that holds 85% of the market, which is the fossil fuel companies. They need to, you know, Kirk makes a big deal about, you know, the fact that he wants to 
you know, use thorium because it's 200 times better than using uranium. But, you know, using uranium is about 10,000 times better than using oil. So let's make the big jump first, and we'll make the little jumps later. Um, yeah, that's that's my my philosophy. And I really think that, you know, if we keep convincing people of the benefits of nuclear energy compared to all the other alternatives, they'll start to see that the risk it is acceptable. You know, it's not perfect. There may be some people killed. There may be some accidents. There may be some plants that get flooded. But, you know, it wouldn't be any different if there was those plants were uh, powered by coal. You know, if, just imagine what would happen if instead of the Fort Calhoun nuclear plant, there had been the same kind of coal plant in the path of that flood as the one that released five billion gallons of sludge from its ash holding pond in in a, a dam collapse in Tennessee a couple of years ago. You know, what would be the the environmental impact of a coal plant like that being exposed to flood compared to a nuclear plant? I mean think about it. What if the the a, a pipeline that was, you know, carrying a lot of natural gas was damaged by a flood. You know, it, it could, if it was a, a, a significant cross country pipeline, it could reduce the capacity for carrying gas for a long time. You know, that could have a significant economic impact. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you, know, you sound like you're from Canada. Um, there are, there's a, a pipeline in Canada, the mainline pipeline, which moves a huge volume of gas from Alberta to the east. And just imagine what would happen if there was an accident on that pipeline that caused it to not be able to carry gas for several months at a time. And it's possible. You know, gas blows up. It, it's pretty obvious that that happens. In the context of, of light water reactors, right, it's not like you're saying anything new has to be brought to the table. It's it's more or less a marketing message or uh nuclear versus uh, hydrocarbon, right? Well, we're, we're, we're doing new things with light water, by the way. I mean, that's one thing that, that sometimes Kirk doesn't seem to quite understand, how much new there's available to refine the designs of light water reactors. Uh, for example, I've seen a video of him pointing to all of the big pipes that go into the pressure vessel of a light water reactor from all of the steam generators and, and coolant pumps. Well, just imagine what would happen if there was a light water reactor where the whole primary steam supply system, the nuclear steam supply system, was in a single vessel. The, the core, the pumps, the control rod drive mechanisms, the steam generators, the pressurizer, all in one steel pressure vessel. No piping penetrations in excess of about three inches in diameter. And by the way, uh, I'm working on that exact reactor, okay? You know, the, the ability, we can, we can build that reactor, the Empower reactor, and, and meet, have it shipped to a site intact, except for fuel. And the whole thing transported to the site. The, you'd have to do some construction work at the site, but, you know, the, the possibility is there. So it's lots of new things that can happen, again, I'm, I think there's some really cool in, inventions and in, in developments in the integral fast reactor and in, in uh, old salt reactors and in the the kind of reactors that that Hyperion and Toshiba. There's a, a company in Argentina which has got a pretty neat little light water reactor, integral fast reactor, the called the Carum. Uh, Westinghouse is is going to you know getting into the small modular reactor game. Um, there's a company called Holtec. There's there's some real excitement going on, right? and and I'm I'm following all of it. Um, I'm excited about a lot of it, and uh, you know, one of the things that I think the nuclear uh, enthusiasts need to do is to let people recognize that this is really a fascinating, you know, high energy development capability here that it could very easily rival the whole tech industry because it does something more important than you know, moving fancy pictures around a computer screen is better than gaming. It's cheap, abundant, 
clean energy. You know, solving that problem, that should be inspiring to people. And and there's lots of ways to do it. You know, it's 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 cool. But a lot of regulations involved and a lot of power structures that have to be we have to recognize that okay, you know, if if you're making money selling natural gas, um, you're gonna make less money. And you may get upset about that, and you may try to fight me. That's okay. I, I can handle upfront competition. I can also tell you that I've come up with an awful lot of stories and a lot of examples, and I've written about them on my blog in a, what I call the Smoking Gun series, where environmental groups, with air quotes, are getting paid or donations or, or sponsored by fossil fuel companies to market against their competitors. Um, you know, it, it, some people say, that ah, it's po- impossible. Why would an oil company pay an environmental group that also fights oil? And the reality is that the best way to increase the price of anything is to reduce the supply. And so even when the environmental groups are fighting against Arctic oil drilling or a new pipeline here or whatever, they are working to lower the supply of energy, which drives up the price for those existing producers which are already producing. And if you're selling a commodity, you'd much rather sell a high-priced commodity than sell a low-priced commodity, particularly if your volume, not necessarily your volume, but if your own personal volume doesn't change. You're already selling as much as you can produce every day sell it for $100 a barrel than $50 a barrel. That's, you know, the, that's what companies like ExxonMobil do. They, they sell every drop they can produce. They may as well sell it at a high price. So the, the distinguishing, to, to distinguish between uh, energy explorers and, I guess, energy producers, it's like there's some people, there's some companies that just produce energy. They're not out to explore new, uh, exploit new resources. Well, I mean, the producers do do some exploration. I mean, ExxonMobil maybe has a 12 or $15 billion a year capital program to keep their production levels roughly equal. They're, they haven't really increased their capacity to produce, but they have to keep exploring just to keep their capacity constant because every year their existing wells deplete a little bit. They get less and less production out, so they have to keep exploring. But they're not trying to grow their ability. They're not trying to take new markets. They're simply, you know, in the business of supplying the market that they already consider to be theirs. They get really threatened, though, if somebody else comes in and starts whacking away at their market share and says, hey, you don't need to buy gas. We're going to build this, you know, we've just brought this new nuclear plant online, which reduces the demand for gas by, you know, a big nuclear plant, 1,000 megawatts. It takes about uh, 180 million cubic feet of natural gas per day to produce a thousand megawatts. Okay, so a single site like the Indian Point facility in New York reduces demand for gas by about 400 million cubic feet a day, 360 to 400 million cubic feet a day. That's a huge chunk of sales. You know, selling the competitive source for the Indian Point reactor uh bring in revenue close to a billion dollars a year to the gas industry, which is why the Indian Point reactor is under so much political pressure by gas-supported politicians to be shut down when it reaches its 40-year relicensing uh, time. You know, the plant's been well-maintained. There's no reason to shut it down. It's safe. It, it's clean. But the government, you know, some politicians who've been receiving contributions from gas companies, want to shut it down, and they're perfectly happy with replacing the output by burning gas, which increases the pollution, increases the price of electricity, but it does provide revenue to their friends. Um, is that a smoking gun example? Like, Could you um, could you go into detail about one example, even if it's that one, and uh, I could I could probably do visuals from your website to, to combine that. Well, the... the the, the clearest, uh, most straightforward smoking gun example that I have on my website was an advertisement taken out uh, in an Australian newspaper by the coal mining uh, union, which basically 
has a, a, a radiation symbol and it says something to the effect of supporting nuclear would drive out coal mining. You know, it, it would affect coal mining jobs. There's another one, you know, it's a dated one, but it was the the uh, Oil Institute of Long Island uh, took out an ad promoting solar power in on Long Island uh, at the time that, that the Shoreham uh, nuclear plant was being built, and it was something about solar, not atoms, or something to that effect. And, and right at the bottom of the of the ad, paid for by the uh, Oil Institute of Long Island, which was the folks that sell oil heat to the Long Island residents. Um, so if you, if you go to the Atomic Insights website, you can see, just do a search for smoking gun, and you'll see an awful lot of, of, of stories where it's a politician who's closely associated with with gas or oil or, or it's it's somebody in the gas or oil industry who's working against nuclear and and trying to raise the barriers of entry to those. You know, there's there's one on the site uh, where the politician was a guy named Tim Worth who, you know, works for Ted Turner. Uh, you may not know Ted Turner. Ted Turner's a, a media mogul who now is one of the biggest landowners in the U.S. He's had a long history of association with the environmental movement, but it just so happens that his land has something in excess of 10,000 natural gas wells uh, on it. Um, you know, I guess I'm just one of his ranches. So he's a big gas producer, but he's, yeah, his, his wife was a woman named, for a long time, yeah, they're divorced now, but his wife was a woman named Jane Fonda, who was the, the, one of the nemesis of the nuclear industry in the U.S. for many years. She's an actress who portrayed a, a role, was a, played a role in the, the, the uh, China Syndrome movie and then campaigned against nuclear energy for years. Again, that, you know, when you see these connections, folks that are making money from gas but fighting nuclear, you know, I, I get real suspicious. Okay, that's a that's a great rant. I'm just gonna. I, you've given me lots of time. This is fantastic. I'm just gonna quickly see if I've missed anything uh, critical here. Um, okay, I guess uh, uh, research and development funds in the United States. Like right now, um, I don't actually know what uh, what the administration is trying to do in terms of uh, boosting the economy, but. Uh, I was under the impression that there was some new R&D money flowing. Do you think that's being uh, distributed wisely, or any co any comments on that? Nuclear R&D in the U.S. is extremely limited. Um, uh, it, at one point during the Clinton administration, actually touched zero for a couple of years. Uh, we've gradually been building back up some of the capacity and some of the, the programs, and I think you know, if you depending on how you count the numbers, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of of five hundred to seven hundred million dollars a year going into nuclear R and D. Uh, some of which, it, or a lot of which, is university programs, which helps to fund new engineers and that kind of stuff. Some amount of research. It's it, the most of it is pretty minor stuff. Um, on the scale of the energy industry, you know, a single. Department of Energy grant to a solar company might be on the order of 500 to a billion, 500 million to a billion dollars for a large solar project underneath the, the program where those projects get 30% of the project cost at the beginning of the project. So instead of putting money into research and development for things that are going to be really reliable and provable and, and useful down the road, our government is giving away money to developers who are not, you know, developing anything new. They're simply building using existing technology, often using uh, materials that are sourced from China or, or Spain or some other country <clears throat> and bringing them into the, importing them into the U.S. and building a construction project. That's a real waste of money as far as I'm concerned. But, so we, we have a little bit of money in R&D. There may be some money into the small modular reactor program, but that's been talked about for a couple of years. It's going to be on the order of 30, 50, 100 million dollars total, which is pretty minor. In the U.S., if a company like 
my company was going to be, the company I work for, is going to be applying for a license to build a nuclear plant, I expect, I don't know what the company estimates are, I'm not in that business, I'm, I'm an engineer analyst, but I expect that the cost to the company of paying the Nuclear Regulatory Commission fees is going to be in the order of 50 to $100 million just for those fees. You know, we, don't, we not only don't encourage development, we actively discourage it by charging new folks the cost of their license application and associated with that cost we also charge them for the cost of teaching the Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulators how to evaluate a technology that they're not familiar with. So if they're doing anything other than a traditional light water reactor, there's going to be some amount of money that's paying $259 per hour to have a bureaucrat sitting in a classroom learning about a new technology. Now, now, Bill Gates articulated, articulated reasonably well that, uh, a way of looking at farming of uh, wind power and solar power. He says it's not like an energy plant, it's farming. You're farming energy because it takes so much uh, space to do it, right? Um, do you just have a broad uh, overview of uh, the renewable energy scene, sort of uh, maybe articulating the low-density nature of it? In my opinion, the, the biggest challenge with renewable energy sources or, or the officially approved renewable energy sources by by folks that you know one that capture that term as their own uh, is is that they're unreliable. You cannot control them. No human, no control system can control the output of a solar panel or a windmill. You get what you get. You also need to invest an awful lot of capital in the form of of collecting equipment. And that capital is often idle because you cannot make the wind blow. So you build a windmill, it requires a lot of steel, a lot of aluminum, a lot of copper, uh, fiberglass, and a lot of capital. You know, and capital is not just money. Capital is physical investment material. And that capital is going to, to be in a fixed location, so you only get the wind at that location. And if that location is not windy today, you will be producing no revenue from that windmill. You know, idle capital is a, is a bad thing for an investor. So, you know, it, it's, it's dumb to be putting a lot of money, particularly when that money comes from taxpayers into uh, wind, solar, anything else that's going to have a lot of idle equipment sitting around waiting for the sun to shine and the wind to blow. It's, it, it's just it's silly. There's no way you, that those sources could compete, and the only way they get investment is when the government steps in and says, we're going to, first of all, we're going to mandate you know, some customers for you. Then we're going to require those customers to pay a higher price than they would otherwise for a competitive source. Then we're going to give you, a developer, 30% of your project costs to um, build that plant, we're going to hand you a check. So we're actually, you know, using you know taxpayer money collected at gunpoint to to support your project. And then we're going to. I mean, it, there's all kinds of incentives added to that just to barely make it a reasonable investment for the investors, but not for the taxpayers who get nothing, no return on their investment. So I'm not. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not one of these. I don't think that there's a place for renewable energy in the marketplace. I think it's a damaging uh, expenditure of funds. It makes it harder for all the other producers to do their job, and it makes it harder for the grid operator to do his job, which is to supply 100% reliable electricity. Now, they don't quite make it 100%, but they get pretty darn close. And, and I don't think there's a reason to make their job any harder or more expensive just to support somebody's fantasy that you can capture all the energy you need from the wind. And that, that's all it is, a fantasy. It ain't reality. Okay, uh, cool. And what's your biggest reason for optimism in, uh, in hopes that we'll be addressing uh, the issue of su sufficient clean energy? Like, what do you, I mean, even in just people's perceptions, right? Like, I, I see Fukushima and I just see a lot of fear right now. Do you, do you have any way of spinning this positively? 
there's a lot of fear. I mean, there's a lot of people that are selling fear. There's a lot of FUD, FUD folks out there. FUD meaning fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, and, and it's hard to be optimistic. It, I have, quite honestly, had some difficult times being optimistic uh, about near-term success. Uh, I'm optimistic because the earth is endowed with some incredibly energy-dense sources of, of energy or incredibly dense source of energy that we know how to extract that energy. We know how to do it safely. And eventually, the truth will come out. You can't fool all the people all the time. That power will be released, and it is going to be released. And if we don't do something soon, it doesn't really matter because other people are going to be releasing that power and eating our economic lunch. They're already doing it. The Chinese are building 25 new uh, light water reactors right now. They're building pebble bed reactors. They're talking about building molten salt reactors. But they're physically building a lot of new capacity that's going to produce cheap, clean electricity and make China a much more pleasant place to live, which means that they'll be able to attract a lot more of the world's talent into their country, and they will be producing a lot more, even more than they are today, of the world's economic output if we don't do something. And, and I'm not willing to let that happen, so I'm doing something by blogging, talking, working every day to get a new uh, modular reactor uh, produced as quickly as we can. Um, and, and I think that the, my reason for optimism is there are lots of other smart people in the world who are recognizing this happening and are working hard to make it uh, a reality. So, you know, between the fact that the material exists and the fact that there's a lot of smart people that know it exists, it gives me the reason for optimism. Okay, cool. And if you, what was your reactor called again? M type? M power. It's a, it, I work for the Babcock and Wilcox company and I'm on the, the project team for the M-Power reactor, which you can find on the web. It's it's an integral pressurized water reactor that builds on about 50 years' worth of experience in producing uh, components and, and other parts of the system. But from a company point of view, it also builds on 150 years' worth of building boilers that are safe and can handle high-pressure steam. We do steam at B&W. And... You know, I know a lot of people look down their nose at steam, but steam still turns an awful lot of turbines and produces an awful lot of power around the world. Most of the power in the world, uh, electricity in the world, comes from steam engines. And it's because we learned how to do it safely a long time ago. Uh, I think you already talked about the technical differences or the advantage, advances you're making in Empower. Um, if if you don't think you had a really good tight recap, do you want to do that again? But if you if uh, if you're good with it, then we'll just call it a day. It should be good. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Rod, for your time. This is really good. I mean, I've got tons and tons of material to work through, and I will um, I'll, I'll bring you basically into the video loop so you can uh, check it out any time as I, I work along. So I'll good. I'll be probably slowly moving Rod content into the video. It's not. It's not going to be like a Rod-centric video, but I'll be picking up pieces and dropping it in through the timeline, okay? Yeah, have fun. It's, you, you gotta, you've, t you've tackled a big project. So. Yeah, it's, it's taken a lot of time. It'll take more time still. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks a lot, Rod. Take care, Gordon. Nice to meet you. Same. Bye. I will talk to you sometime soon. Bye.